The Collapse video series is for entertainment purposes only. Do not commit acts of violence. Saturday morning, the electricity went out on Wednesday night. Most of the country has never experienced three days in a row of no electricity. Hurricane-prone regions like Miami and Houston have been through storms where electricity was not restored for a week or more. But they knew the storm was coming and they had prepared with extra water, gasoline, and non-perishable foods. This took them by surprise. And when a city is hit by a hurricane, the residents know help is coming from the rest of the country. This time, the whole country, two countries actually, are hit at the same time and everyone knows it. The initial confidence that everything will be fine has completely worn off. People are finally scared. The loss of water is the biggest problem. In the cities that have backup generators for their water departments, there is still water and sewer. For cities that do not have backup generators, there is neither. Families had a week of food in the pantry, but not a week of water. The dishes have mounted, the toilets don't work. Not knowing what to do, people have begun urinating and defecating in streets and alleys. At first, when the water ran out, there were still warm sodas and a few bottles of water in the house to drink. Now those are gone. Everyone is getting thirsty. They are considering the very real possibility that the time it will take to restore the electricity is more time than they have. People begin descending to the rivers to get drinking water. They try not to think about the runoff from people using the streets as a toilet. This is an epidemic waiting to happen. Some attempt to boil their water to purify it, but without electricity or gas, they can't use the stove. People with a grill have a safe way to do that, but not everyone has a grill or a yard. Those in apartment buildings go to the roof or side of the building to build a fire to boil water from the river, burning whatever they can find. It was inevitable that some of the fires would get out of hand. Without any city water, the fire hydrants are dry. The firefighters have no way to put out fires. They are left to burn and spread. The cities are on fire. The looting that had been minimal the previous day now takes place in earnest. People who normally would not engage in looting are breaking into stores to find water. They are not dying of thirst yet, but they know it's coming and the time to find clean stored water is now. Once the store is broken into and the crime is committed, it seems silly to only take the water. People seize everything they can from the stores. The lawlessness leads retail stores to also be broken into. Clothing stores, gun stores, jewelry stores, and the like that aren't expected to have water. The pharmacies are hit by drug addicts looking for narcotics. The commercial areas of the cities and suburbs have become frightening. The police have been doing their best, but they are now out of gasoline. They've been using their cars to patrol as usual since the blackout, and ran out of gas before the general population. The police are concerned that getting back up in an emergency is difficult without the cars. They arrest looters, but have trouble transporting them. The offenders who are taken to the station quickly fill up the holding cells, which are now without electricity or water. Criminal court judges tell the police that if there is no electricity or water in the holding cells, the prisoners must be released on their own reconnaissance. Without the ability to apprehend and detain suspects, police wonder what they are supposed to do. Families are coming to the conclusion that they need to flee the city. Yesterday, those who had plenty of gas and a clear place to go calmly chose to depart. Now it isn't a choice. The city has become dangerous. They are surprised to find that there is no gridlock. A handful of people left the first day, about a third left yesterday, and as much as a third will remain in the city because they either have no car or no gas or nowhere to go. It is mostly the poor who do not leave the city. 
Unlike yesterday, today people are taking more risks and trying to make it to places they're not sure they have enough gas to reach. They make it an hour or two out of the city and onto the interstate. Those who run out of gas on the highway sit in their cars for a while not knowing what to do. There's no way to call someone. No one is coming to rescue them. They get out of the car and start walking, dragging their suitcases behind them. In Washington, D.C., technicians are sent to the Capitol Power Plant to get the electricity going. Critical federal buildings have their own backup generators, but those are for short-term use and are already almost out of fuel. A long-term solution is needed. The Capitol Power Plant, which is within the city limits of Washington, has for decades been supplying hot water to heat a handful of key government buildings. It used to produce electricity until 1951. The plant can either use coal or natural gas. The technicians are assigned to make it produce electricity to power critical government buildings and to reconnect power lines directly to the plant as needed where they had been removed since 1951. These tasks require highly skilled technicians, time, and very particular materials that are hard to obtain when the supply line is disrupted. The military is assigned to do what it takes to get the materials and to commandeer the coal to fuel the plant. The plant is not large enough to power the entire city, but it will keep the federal government running. In meetings regarding commandeering supplies and coal for the Capitol Power Plant, it is also agreed that the military will commandeer water to take to the cities. The National Guard will distribute the water. In Ottawa, the capital of Canada, there are multiple hydroelectric plants within the city. The Prime Minister assigns technicians to create a direct connection between Hydro Ottawa Generating Station No. 2 and the various critical government buildings. The power station is the oldest functioning hydroelectric plant in Canada. It is also just six blocks from Parliament. As with the power plant in D.C., this is not something that can be done in a matter of days. It will take some time and difficult to obtain materials, but the direct connection will be established. Communication is now very limited, but not non-existent. Landlines still work. They operate through copper cables that are frequently buried underground. The copper cable network and the systems used to manage the calls require very little electricity to work. For many decades, landline telephone companies have maintained backup generators. Because the energy requirements are relatively low, the phone companies find it reasonable to keep enough fuel on hand to power the generators for a full week. In the general population, standard landlines are disfavored over phone lines that go through the internet, which won't work when the router is off, or they opt to rely on cell phones only. In offices where landlines are common, many of the office phones themselves require electricity so they can store phone numbers, among other functions. Traditional non-electric telephones using landlines have become very uncommon. Government offices do have them for emergencies. The landlines are currently the primary means of government communication. But that will come to an end in a few days when the phone company generators run out of fuel. It is understood that in a few days, only a fraction of non-military government operations outside of the capitals will be able to function as communication becomes extremely difficult. Foreign aid from the U.S. and Canada to poor nations comes to a sudden halt. Food shipments already scheduled are suddenly canceled. Aid is still coming from Europe and elsewhere, but the loss of U.S. and Canadian aid leaves a shortfall. Word quickly spreads and there is a run on the stores in poor nations. Shelves are cleared. Many sub-Saharan African countries experience a rapid, extreme food shortage. Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, which normally received the equivalent of 10 to 15 percent of their GDP in funds wired from relatives in the United States, already feel the effects of the loss of cash. No one is spending money on non-essentials like restaurants, movies, or nails. Employers send their hourly employees home to save some cash. Middle-class families lay off their part-time domestic servants. 
the impact on poor nations is sudden and severe. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's episode. For an ad-free version of these videos, go to BitChute or Brideon, links in the description. Even with the ads, there is not enough YouTube ad revenue to support this show. Please consider subscribing on Subscribestar. Next week on The Collapse. Nursing homes are abandoned. The workers already on shift stay for another eight hours. But when the shift after that doesn't show up, they decide to leave. A few choose to stay behind and beg the others to remain also, but the workers are worried about their families. The few who remain are completely overwhelmed. The elderly languish.